Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It is wonderful to be here. Um, this is, sorry, I have some move, motion behind me. Um, so thank you so much for being part of this panel. I'm honored uh, to talk about uh, the importance of memoir writing. My name is Isabel Stenzel Burns. I am 49 years old and uh, have cystic fibrosis and had a transplant 17 years ago. I'm also um, very privileged to have had the transformative experience of writing a memoir myself together with my twin sister, Annabelle. Uh, we wrote The Power of Two in 2007 and it opened up so many doors and opportunities. So now I'm honored to introduce three people, um, each of whom has written and, and published an extraordinary uh, powerful book about loss and growth and devotion to patients, issues well known to many of our CF community. Each represents a unique perspective, that of patient, parent, and provider. Together, they inspire us to recognize the vital importance of memoir. Some of you may remember Diane Shader Smith uh, from last year's conference. Diane is a publicist, speaker, writer, CF fundraiser, and advocate for bioethics and phage therapy. After her daughter, Mallory, died at age 25, Diane compiled and edited Mallory's diary entries which were published in as the book, Salt in My Soul, A Unfinished Life. It's been an LA Times and Amazon bestseller and has been featured in the New York Times and Hollywood Reporter, among other publications. This moving book will soon be released as a feature length documentary, very exciting. Marianne O'Hare is the author most recently of Little Matches, a memoir of grief and life, which was inspired by NineLivesNotes.com, a blog that Marianne kept while her daughter Caitlin was waiting for a lung transplant. Since Caitlin's passing, Marianne has been certified as an end of life doula so that she may better speak to the state of end of life care in our culture. Little Matches is a People Magazine book of the week. And Marianne's end of life legacy work has been featured in the New York Times and elsewhere. And I want to mention it is most fitting that today is Caitlin's 38th birthday. So we all honor and remember Caitlin in, in your story. Dr. David Weil, I'm honored to have him here, who was formerly my transplant doctor, is the former director of the Center of Advanced Lung Disease and Lung and Heart Lung Transplant Program at Stanford University Medical Center. He is currently the principal of the Weil Consulting Group, which focuses on improving the delivery of pulmonary, ICU, and transplant care. Dr. Weil has served in a variety of international and national roles, both in the private and public sectors, and has authored numerous medical articles, book chapters, and editorials. His memoir, Exhale, Hope, Healing, and a Life in Transplant, was released this year. Together, they will present three perspectives, one purpose, why medicine needs memoir, Thank you very much for all being here. And thank you so much for having us. We worked hard to prepare our deck and want you to focus on the images. So we will hide ourselves from view during the talk and then come back afterwards. Thanks. These are unprecedented times for those of us working in healthcare with increasing pressure to do better, to be better. We know our system is broken, but figuring out how to fix a $4 trillion industry that's fraught with problems is a question that continues to plague many of us who work in the field. The shifting of medical care from physician focused to patient centered is great in theory and has proven to be an important priority as we address disparities in healthcare. But the reality is that we will only achieve health equity if we consider personal, cultural, and political contexts. So how do we do this? 
We believe that storytelling is one tool that has the power to make things better. Today, we will share the use of storytelling as a teaching tool for continuing medical education. We will share three perspectives, the patient, the parent, and the provider. My name is Marianne O'Hara. I've spent my adult life writing literary fiction, short stories, a novel. Fiction was always a way for me to ruminate on the ideas and issues that preoccupied me, to ask what if, then share my views and insights with the outside world. I'm Diane Shader Smith. I've always been a writer, first in TV on a medical drama, then nonfiction journalism with an emphasis on medical articles, and finally marketing. My work can be summed up in four words, storytelling with a purpose. I'm David Weil. For 25 years, I worked on the front lines of medicine, first with AIDS patients, then as a lung transplant doctor. I was witness to what's great in a hospital, inspirational parent, patients, brilliant colleagues, miracles that happen when lives were saved. But I also saw medical errors, ego-driven clashes between doctors, and profit-driven decisions made by hospital administrators. I came home from the hospital every night with stories in my head, stories that I knew needed to be told, but how? Ultimately, I landed on memoir, and in so doing, approached writing in much the same way I did the early stages of my medical career, with apprehension, frustration, and exhilaration when the words finally came. As a writer, I share what the doctor part of me experiences, the emotion and thought processes that go into caring for the sickest of the sick. My daughter Mallory was one of the sickest of the sick. She had cystic fibrosis. Dr. Weil was one of her doctors at Stanford. Mallory's diagnosis imposed a maturity on her and forced her to ask hard questions from a young age. To better understand her disease, to make peace with her prognosis, Mallory started writing at the age of 15 and didn't stop until her death at 25. Today, I will use her words from 2,500 pages she left behind. Here goes. We are the writers of our own story. That our story will someday end is inevitable for all of us, but the way we get there is not. The piece that's often lost on us is that our level of control, especially in the hospital setting, extends to how we react to situations, not necessarily to the situations themselves. My effort to thread that awareness into narrative begins with this understanding. I channel my favorite poet, Pablo Neruda, as I collect the wisps, the threads of my untidy happenings. My hope is that my insights will help others living with or loving someone with chronic illness. My daughter, Caitlin, also had cystic fibrosis. We met Diane and Mallory in Pittsburgh, where Caitlin and Mallory were waiting to be transplanted. After Caitlin passed, Writing the real suddenly seemed like the only kind of writing that mattered, and I too landed on memoir. In a meaningful coincidence, I met David Weil at a writing workshop when we were both working on our books. His about hope, healing, and a life in transplant. Mine a meditation on universal truths about loving and losing and looking for answers to the big life questions. At the same time, Mallory's memoir was being published posthumously. Our three memoirs have brought us together to look at chronic illness, transplant, end of life issues, and grief. Three perspectives navigating the healthcare system with the common goal of improving outcomes. Always important, but especially critical when life and death are in the balance. Our stories come from the world of transplant, but their teaching points are universal. There is demonstrable science behind what we all know to be true. We learn facts about a person's situation and it can be hard to empathize. We learn their story and we care. Neuroscientist Paul Zak was the first to discover that our brains synthesize oxytocin when stories engage us and that the molecule also motivates reciprocation. As we speak, we encourage you to remember that medical records exist for these stories, records that only tell a part of the whole. Doctors are the puppeteers of my medical journey. They pull the right strings at the right time to keep me alive. In a four month period, I spent 87 days in the hospital, never free more than 10 consecutive days. One was a 31 day marathon. 
where I was in and out of the ICU for hemoptysis. It was terrifying. I had extreme physical pain, constant nausea and vomiting, bone crushing fatigue, fear that my multi-drug resistant Burkholderia sinocepatia infection had become uncontrollable and that it was ruining my chance to get a double lung transplant. To date, I've had 67 hospitalizations, ranging from weeks to months. Many people have some notion of a second home, a sleepaway camp, their grandparents. I've spent so much time in the hospital, the house as we call it, that I've come to feel that hospitals are so much more than a physical infrastructure. They act as a sort of ad hoc community center for those of us living parallel existences as we straddle the line between the sick and the well worlds. Chronic illness interferes with social connections, but it can also create other more powerful opportunities for community. We're buzzed into the ICU at 3 a.m. where Caitlin is suddenly on ECMO. The surgeon promised us she wouldn't remember any of the procedure and I'd expected her to be unconscious. Unconsciousness is easier to witness, easier to bear, but her eyes are open and they are terrified. I sit bedside, hiding my terror, the way I have for years in hospitals. I remember everything she says. In the days to come, as we wait for offers, her surgeon says things like, we'll get you transplanted, Caitlin. And I have a good feeling about this weekend. I want to believe him. A parent who hadn't lived inside the medical system the way I have for years probably would. I am 99% sure he cannot be certain that he is just projecting positivity. Still, I don't know the ins and outs of the transplant world. That 1% seizes on any sliver of hope. His false optimism is meant well, and it is human and kind, but it increases my anxiety, my need to always know what's what. Picture this, I'm the medical director of a new lung transplant program. Brian is one of my first patients. He is 19, shy, with a developmental disorder that makes him slur his words. I spend time getting to know him and his situation. I want the team to list him, but I have no idea how the selection meeting will go. I present the details of his case, shading the presentation, a practice I learned long ago to persuade colleagues. My shading involves highlighting his sweetness, his family support, and downplaying his difficulties. He has some learning challenges, I say, but a committed family and he has always been compliant with his medical regimen. These are buzzwords I know to use. I'm trying to make it so the team can't say no. I think my presentation is convincing them until I stop talking and I'm out with silence. One of the old guard physicians finally says, should we transplant someone who is mentally, I mean, slow or whatever he is? Not too many lungs to go around. I tell the team it is in our place to make judgments about a patient based on their IQ. A life is a life, I say. Who are we to put value on it? Narrative medicine as a course of studies fairly new, emerging in response to a healthcare system that places bureaucratic concerns over the needs of the patient. Dr. Rita Sharon, who is credited with starting this movement, argues that using narrative medicine fortifies healthcare and helps practitioners implement patient-centered care. Medicine requires narrative competence, she says, which she defines as the ability to acknowledge, absorb, interpret, and act on the plights of others. Brian got a chance to live with new lungs because his doctor spent time getting to know the person and his supportive family. As a patient, I want you to know me to understand what led me to be in your exam room as a person, not just a set of symptoms. I want you to know what works and what doesn't. For me, it's not the big groundbreaking health events or even the scariest set of test results. It's the petty frustrations and humiliations that happen in the hospital that wear on me, overtax my patience and goodwill and leave me drained and weakened. It's when they don't send an RT for seven hours even though you can't breathe and are in distress, but you can't blame anyone in particular because it's the system. 
It's when your IV antibiotic hasn't arrived because it wasn't ordered. Why not? The dose is weight-based and they don't have your weight, even though they could have taken it at any point during the seven hours you were in the ER. It's when hospital personnel don't properly gown and glove for your contact isolation status, but then tell your visitors they need to. It's when you ask for meds because you feel like you're drowning from lack of oxygen and they treat you as if you're a drug seeker. It's when it's been 12 hours of a grueling emergency admission and the nurse says, it's after midnight. They'll wait for morning to do the intake and you're grateful. Your daughter desperately needs sleep. But as soon as she drifts off, a bright overhead light snaps on and a resident barges in saying, I'm here to do your intake. It's when you get a middle of the night text that reads, this is pure torture. I can't breathe. I keep asking for help, but nobody's coming. The medical interview is historically a pillar of medicine. Nowadays, a patient is asked a perfunctory, what brings you here today? with no eye contact as the response is typed into the electronic medical record. We need to connect with our patients emotionally and with empathy, but we know that patients and their families vary. They have different backgrounds, education levels, and socioeconomic status. As such, they need different amounts and methods of communication. As clinicians, we must develop an understanding of what our patients want and then give it to them. We must also balance the need to deliver hard truths with the need to always offer hope. A patient's right to know everything has to trump a doctor's reluctance to re reveal everything we know. Communication is key in creating trust between doctor and patient. Too many medical errors are caused by poor communication. Medical errors that result in up to 250,000 deaths per year in the United States. Collaboration, transparency, dignity, truth, the essence of good medicine. It's pretty clear we need to do a better job of individualizing communication. From the earliest days, Caitlin and I most appreciated the people who acknowledged that medicine is an uncertain art and who were transparent regarding the information they shared with us. Their words helped us accept the truth that medical providers are human and cannot predict the course of what is unpredictable. Not telling everything, not telling us everything doesn't protect us. One of Caitlin's finest doctors was world renowned, yes, but what made her stand out was that she would spend time with us, thinking out loud, asking questions, listening to the answers, often changing her mind about a particular course of treatment. She once said that patients with complicated cases couldn't have doctors who think inside the rules. I never forgot that. I need to deliver truth at the same time I need to provide the patient and the family with hope. Caitlin and Mallory each needed new lungs, each faced certain death if a donor wasn't available in time. And they were the fortunate ones, the ones who gained access to the waiting list. For people of color, implicit bias makes getting listed for transplant even more difficult. If a patient is lucky enough to be transplanted, there are still no guarantees. Transplant is a miracle, but also a human endeavor performed by people with powerful attributes and profound flaws. As clinicians, we try to balance optimism and reality, hope and the truth. It can be a hard balance, especially when dealing with serious chronic illness. It's hard for providers to deliver difficult news and it's hard to receive it. People with chronic illness navigate the liminal space between living and dying all the time. Whenever bad news came, I was always aware of myself splitting into two, the inner me that was falling apart and the outer me, the calm one, the buffer who could absorb and ease some of my daughter's fear and anxiety. Caitlin's lung transplant doctor in Pittsburgh was empathic, but always frank. At one fraught point, he answered a hopeful question with, I've learned not to make guesses. It was hard to hear, but I valued his honesty. I could work with it. The uncertain prognosis of chronic illness breeds chronic anxiety. Not knowing what's what worsens the situation. When I'm in clinic, they say they don't want my parents involved anymore. 
that I need to be a responsible adult, take charge of my medications, stick to a rigid treatment schedule, own my disease. This is ridiculous since chronologic age doesn't always match developmental age. It's also insane since I need more help from my mom as I'm getting sicker. The irony of this policy is that when they admit me, they strip me of my autonomy, infantilize me. They take away my enzymes, meds I carry around and take on my own multiple times a day. They tell me an RT has to do my treatment, a treatment that I do on my own multiple times a day. They impose rules, some that make sense, some that just don't. As a mother, a caregiver, I need the provider to recognize the value of my role as constant witness to my daughter's condition. She depends on me. I am a critical part of her care team. Caregivers in this country are almost always an unpaid family member. There are 53 million of us in this country. Caregiver stress syndrome is real. It is emotional and physical exhaustion compounded by the distress of loving your person just so much. Caitlin didn't live with the fear that she would die. She lived with the fear that I would die. These stories underscore the need to put humanity back in healthcare. Our system, which is not a system at all, but rather a fragmented set of profit centers, is in danger of losing its soul, replaced by an unruly behemoth that is neither efficient, equitable, or manageable. This uncomfortable truth is due to many factors, insurance companies dictating patient care, overscheduled patient encounters in the clinic, consistent placement of profit over purpose. Patients need their doctors to treat them and provide therapies, of course, but doctors need to spend as much time hearing patient stories as they spend feeding the electronic medical record. Developing the ability to engage, to draw out a patient, is a clinician's most valuable tool and one that can be difficult to learn, always the hardest skill for me to teach to my trainees. But here's a suggestion to my medical colleagues. Start patient meetings with questions not about their medical self, but about their personal self. Where did you grow up? Tell me about your family. What do you like to do when you're not getting medical care? Miscommunication can happen so easily, but the more we listen, the more we hear, which can help establish reasonable expectations. And listening not only means listening to the patient who knows her condition better than anyone, it means listening to the people who intimately know and provide care for the patient. The pulmonologist on call in the ER came into my room. So he began, why don't you tell me what happened? I woke up at 2 a.m. needing to cough. I could feel the blood pooling in my lungs. I coughed up a half a cup of blood. It felt like it was never going to stop. The doctor took notes as I talked and asked the usual questions about my medical history, but he didn't really engage. Each time I cough up blood, I wonder if this will be the time, the time when the blood spilling up my lungs and out my mouth will burst forth so fast that I can't breathe. The time my hemoptysis isn't just a scare, but the final swift deadly bullet. CF is not a disease that you can forget about until you sick, until you get sick. It's a disease you're fighting every minute of every day. How do those of us with chronic life-threatening illnesses live with the impending fear of a deadly event? I've noticed that I've started to project my fear of death onto other extremely unlikely situations. Things that never scared me before now terrify me. But simultaneously in the moment, homoptysis events that could be deadly don't scare me. It does occur to me that maybe I should be scared because each time could be the time. Remarkably, looking back, although Caitlin's transplant evaluation seemed comprehensive at the time, the team never talked about what would happen if transplant didn't happen. There was no plan beyond hope. They never discussed any what ifs. As a culture, we have become far removed from the awareness, the recognition of the arc of a lifetime from accepting our mortality. We are all temporary, yet our healthcare system doesn't talk about that. 
the subject of death is taboo and medicine treats death as failure. Early in my career, failure wasn't on my agenda, nor were mistakes. My plan was to save lives, not lose them. Through the years, there were lots of deaths, each one traumatic. We physicians have an innate desire to control circumstances. It took a long time for me to acknowledge that many circumstances are simply not controllable. At the height of my career, I su suffered a crisis that upended my life. Some would call it burnout, but burnout suggests that the problem resides within the individual, that the individual lacks the resources or resilience to withstand the work environment. I would argue in favor of more recent thinking, a rebranding, if you will, that burnout is moral injury because an array of factors, the corporatization of medicine, the drudgery of electronic medical records, hospital politics, the dehumanizing way physicians have traditionally been trained, in fact, wreaks havoc on the provider. These factors then lead to a higher risk of major medical errors and double the risk of adverse patient safety incidents, which leads to worse quality of care and decreased patient satisfaction. I've declined quickly in the last month. My lung function went from 48% a month and a half ago to 33% last week. Every decision at this point seems significant. Every complication more ominous, every day more precious. Here is what I'm hoping for if I'm lucky enough to be transplanted. I want to be as comfortable as possible through opioids or anti-anxiety meds, but not be so out of it that I'm unconscious unless the pain is severe enough to necessitate that. To maintain dignity to whatever extent possible, to receive whatever life-saving tactic is appropriate, to maintain my ability to communicate in some way, to have the blinds open for natural light, to have calming music to listen to, to have my mom, my dad, Micah, Jack, or a friend with me at all times, preferably with a hand on me, so I will feel their presence. I want to live. Let's talk about how most clinicians view palliative care. We view it as giving up, throwing in the towel, failure. This is wrong, but this doesn't mean this is not the prevailing attitude of too many of us who take care of patients who are always at risk of dying. All the more reason that patients need this kind of support. We need to put away our biases and give them what they need. Palliative care is another healthcare issue that could use a rebranding. Everyone associates it with hospice, with near death. It's misunderstood. It might very well benefit from a new name. Caitlin was more than two years into her transplant wait, and we were at her monthly appointment when a palliative care doc walked in and introduced herself. Caitlin panicked. I panicked. The doctor explained that palliative care is simply specialized medical care for people living with serious illness. And we knew that, sort of, but why was it only being introduced now when she was well into her life with end-stage cystic fibrosis? Let people know what palliative care is. Let them know that it exists. Let palliative care begin with diagnosis, regardless of prognosis. Palliative care was never offered to me. I thought it was only for dying patients with no other treatment options. But when I was going through a long hospitalization, a social worker friend came to visit me. The dark voices in my head, the brokers of hopelessness met their match in Danielle. Never selling unwarranted optimism, she validated my fears and offered perspective. We discussed advanced care planning and my end of life preferences. She introduced me to the concept of palliative care as one of the rounding services and also voicing my choices a tool to help terminal patients express what is important to them in case they become unable to speak. Danielle taught me how to manage pain and how to advocate for my own palliative care needs. We discussed grief and fear and coming to terms with a dire prognosis. We all know that the terms fighting the disease and losing the battle are cliches, yet we still use them. Are patients to feel they failed? 
Words have power. Patients don't fail when they die and providers don't fail when they can't ultimately prevent death. Planning for a worst case scenario, especially early on when the worst case is unlikely or at least not imminent can go a long way toward easing anxiety in the present. A worst case plan allows patients to focus on the best case scenario and at the same time, reflect on how their loved ones and their medical team can best support them if the worst does happen. A let's make a plan for the worst and then work toward the best conversation can be a hard one, but I believe it to be necessary and the medical team must initiate it. Because when the worst happens, a human in shock flooded with adrenaline and cortisol or nearly unconscious is a poor decision maker. A study at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine used professional actors and simulation-based mastery learning course practices to train physicians to deliver bad news to patients in a clear and compassionate way. The study found that every medical student who received the interactive training acquired the skills necessary to have those hard conversations. If my daughter had really known the reality of ECMO and fasciotomies and amputation and other desperate last ditch efforts, she might have made a different decision the night she went into the medical ICU to be put on ECMO. She might have chosen a good death. As patients, we must make decisions balancing two often disparate goals, maintaining current quality of life while extending lifespan without complete information about how much threat we're really facing. I don't wanna diminish my quality of life too early, but I don't wanna wait so long that getting the treatment I need isn't possible. I do need to have some kind of backup plan. I need to know that when the IVs eventually stop holding me steady and my lung function plummets, there will be a center that will list me. There are no guarantees of life for anyone. Patients straddle the line between the sick and the well world. Clinicians straddle the line between emotional connection to our patients and professional distance. When every daughter became my daughter, every wife, my wife, every mother, my mother, was that a good or bad thing? Certainly conversations with patients and their families that are early in transparent establish a shared set of expectations that provide a healthier balance for patients and healthcare providers. I always expected to get a transplant, but every center in the country turned me down, except UPMC. The intake coordinator that was so happy to offer me the evaluation appointment, then issued a warning that we would face problems getting coverage. She was right. Our insurance company employed multiple stall tactics that made getting approval a near impossibility. It made me wonder what happens to the patients who don't have resources. They likely die. It's so absurd, it makes me shake with rage. If obituaries were honest, some would read, our dearly beloved died from bureaucratic incompetence and corporate cheapness. There are other systemic problems in healthcare. Sometimes looking at a particular case can shine the light on a larger issue. Early in my career, I approached a black woman whose son had been declared brain dead following a gunshot wound to his head. Her pastor quizzed me, trying to ascertain whether everything had indeed been done for the young man. The grieving mother didn't believe that there was no hope and she was vehement. She would not consent to organ donation. At first, I was so invested in saving my dying patients that I honestly couldn't understand. But then I realized the answer was simple. She didn't trust me, didn't trust the white medical establishment. That distrust is part of a collective distrust that long predates the highly publicized Tuskegee syphilis study. Historic mistreatment of people of color must be addressed using a multi-pronged approach in order to correct the imbalances that comes with implicit racial bias, which exists in all areas of medicine. Data tells you that people of color are less likely to donate their organs. 
stories tell you why. I'm back in the hospital thinking about what I want. I want to wake up in the morning and take a deep, full breath. I want that breath to fill me up, to imbue me with joy and energy, not to irritate or pain me and set off a spasm of coughing. I want to be able to do the things that I dream of while I sleep, things that are taxing in reality, hiking, running, biking, swimming, falling, leaping, soaring. Opioids were never part of my treatment, but now that my chest pain is unbearable, I need them to breathe. The doctors are reluctant to up my dose. They say it will be hard to get off them. The opioid crisis is another healthcare failure, one that has gotten a great deal of national attention. Our industry has been rightfully criticized for its development. Yet pain management often becomes a point of contention in hospital settings, especially when a patient is dying or living with chronic pain. One of the most humane ways to take care of patients is to control their pain. Pain management is always the goal, but complete absence of pain isn't always possible. We need to explain why. Saying, for example, on the one hand, I want your pain controlled, but on the other, I want to be careful not to cause opioid related side effects like respiratory depression, GI problems, or a clouded mental status. This is an example of an easy conversation we can have that is efficient and explains what we as clinicians are thinking. No matter how much extra time it takes, it's better than leaving the patients and their families with the impression that we don't care about their pain. Spending 31 years in and out of the hospital and ultimately losing your child gives you a keen perspective about the best our healthcare system has to offer, but also a profound understanding of systemic failings. As a white woman of privilege, I'm acutely aware that disparities from skewed social and economic policies made things easier for Caitlin than for many others. Disparities are rampant in America, along with persistent inequities in so many areas, disability, geographic location, sexual identity, economic status, race. Our country is truly a melting pot with myriad cultures and customs. Storytelling is one way to address cultural divides and their inherent biases. Since narrative styles differ greatly among patients from divergent cultural backgrounds, it's necessary to bear witness to voices from all communities. Understanding the nuance and complexity of people's stories allows us to move past our biases, to look more broadly at definitions of health beyond what's in the textbooks. At heart, we are all human and we are connected. Pain, suffering, disease, grief, none of that knows boundaries. Cystic fibrosis does a lot of taking. It does not discriminate. I am now limited in what I can do, but not in what I can say. I used to think you had to do something really big to have it be meaningful. Now, I think you can make a difference in big and small ways. And sometimes ways that seem small are actually really big. Writing is an example. I have come to understand the task of the writer is to help others understand and empathize with a life experience they've never lived. It's why I document everything. I am now every mother who has ever lost a child and asked, where is she? Is she? Is there more to life than this life? Does my existence have any real purpose? Does anyone's? We who face trauma, illness, or severe loss often find ourselves transformed and come to question or better understand what life is really for. Our stories teach and heal, they comfort and they can transform. Storytelling can play an important role in the curriculum for medical training, during the medical interview, in clinical practice, with peer reviewed evidence and with health education campaigns. And stories can prompt scientific inquiry, get people asking, what if? We know that stories aren't going to cure the toughest problems we face in medicine. 
But we do know that stories can provide that what if spark in scientists and get patients to ask, could it be? We want all potential treatments vetted using rigorous scientific methods. We have seen what can happen when we don't do this. But all discoveries begin with an idea, as Diane will now explain in her own words. Near the end of Mallory's life, my husband Mark worked with epidemiologist Stephanie Strathdy to find bacteriophages, viruses that kill bacteria. On November 14 of 2017, Mallory became the first patient with cystic fibrosis to receive phage therapy. We learned from the autopsy that the phages had started to work. Mallory just didn't get them in time. After she died and Mallory's memoir, Salt in My Soul, An Unfinished Life, made its way into the hands of readers, so many reached out to ask about this treatment. Medical centers that hadn't heard about it are now doing research. Others are signing on to be part of the first multi-center study. Mallory wrote, I have a strong urge to write something that will change people. By all accounts, she did. I began Little Matches nine months after Caitlin's passing. It felt important to write from inside real-time grief to make a record of it. I wanted anyone reading it to understand how it was. And if they were going through something similar, to feel validated, to be able to say, yes, this is how it is and to know they weren't alone. And I wanted to inspire readers. I wanted to share Caitlin's wisdom, her humor, her example. I wanted to keep her alive. I wrote Exhale, Hope, Healing, and a Life in Transplant to share the human stories of my patients and to pull back the curtain to reveal what a team of people goes through when their decisions determine who gets a chance to live. A sense of urgency punctuates our every day. Our pro profession perpetuates the myth that doctors are superhuman, but we're not. Those of us who chose a career in medicine do so because we want to help people. When we don't, when we lose patients, often due to circumstances that are beyond our control, the effects on us as clinicians can be soul crushing. When I experienced my own career crisis, I turned to writing as a form of healing. To anyone involved with our healthcare system, I urge you to consider writing your own stories, the trials, the successes and failures, the lessons learned from patients and family members and caregivers, then share them with your friends and family, and if you're brave enough, with the public. When we tell stories about real people who interact with the healthcare system and suffer indignities, when we reveal disparities, or when medical errors that harm real people come alive on the page, we are putting human faces on events and statistics that only stories can reveal. Stories that trigger the oxytocin and remind us why we entered this profession, inspiring us to do better and be better. Patient stories, medical memoirs, basically any human tales of resilience, bravery, revelation, and triumph that engage us, can lift us, and generate the empathy that motivates us to help each other out. I am now a childless parent, but I've redefined my caregiving role and become an end of life doula to use my storytelling skills to teach people how to record life interviews with their loved ones or with themselves. Life interviews, legacy stories, aren't just for sickness and end of life. They are a way for all of us to reflect on our lives, shape our legacies and connect regardless of age or current health. As Mallory's mom, sitting bedside for years, I saw the way doctors, nurses, and ancillary professionals interacted with patients. I came to understand that every single caregiver has the power to make their patients feel safe, understood, and cared for. Nonverbal communication speaks volumes, but radical listening, allowing the patients to share their life experience wholly and uninterrupted, breaks down barriers it's vital to understanding the struggles 
experienced by both marginalized and privileged communities. Medicine and literature have long intersected, but to really improve outcomes, we need patients to share more, to reveal clues that can inform treatment decisions or signal which communication style might work. And we need to hear from caregivers who are under assault from unhealthy hospital protocols. Today, you heard from Mallory, Mary Ann, and David. They don't have all the answers, but their insights are invaluable, and they add to our collective consciousness about the ways our healthcare system can and should be improved. They are three of so many important voices, voices that remind us humanity is the soul of medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, hold on, hold on. Wow, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Excuse me, let me turn my video on. There you are, Marianne. Hi. Can you see me okay? Yes. Good, good. Well, thank you. That was incredible. What a performance. What an uh, intersection, a kind of weaving in of not just personal story and beautiful photographs of, of uh, your kids and beautiful, your family, Dr. Weil. Um, but of course, very, very poignant messages of what we need in um, healthcare as patients, families, and providers. Thank you so much. There were some real gems there, just hope, emphasizing the importance of palliative care, um, emphasizing more en moral injury, and uh, again, will to live and, and uh, so many complex ideas. I know we are running out of time. I'm sorry for that. I wish I could stay on longer and have the audience ask you questions, um, but we have to be mindful of other speakers coming on. Um, so I wanna just thank you all so much and uh, hope that we can uh, debrief a different time. But um, I wanna thank the audience for listening to all three of our speakers and their presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And we will be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.